All right, this is a continuation of the notes that we were talking about on Wednesday's class. Um, we were going to do some more of the writing equations of lines from section 1.3. So let's look at the examples that we skipped over in there. So we did not do the following four problems. If we know the point is negative 2, 7 and the slope is 0, can we write the equation of the slope intercept and general form? Um, on a test, we would specify which one of those. You usually don't have to do both. So we had this formula y minus y1 equals m parentheses x minus x1. x1, y1 is the point, and remember m is the slope. So this is y minus 7 equals negative 2 excuse me, zero, because the slope is zero. So zero and then x minus negative two, so that'd be plus two. And notice zero times anything is just zero. And when we add the seven over, um, so this actually is general. We don't have an x term here. And this is slope intercept for us. Okay, let's look at number four. So first of all, we don't have a slope, so we need to find it using our slope formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So this would be five minus three over zero minus four, which is two over negative four, which reduces down to negative one half. Now, if you're careful, you'll notice that we already have the y-intercept here, because it's zero comma five. So I can go ahead and write that as y equals negative one-half x plus five. Okay, so that would be my slope intercept. To get it in general form, we wanted everything on one side, so add the one-half x over. Still have our plus y, subtract the five over. And then remember, no fractions or the leading coefficient cannot be negative. So we're okay on that part, but we have to get rid of the fraction. So we'll multiply everything in the whole um, equation by 2. So that would make this x plus 2y. 2 times negative 5 would be negative 10. And 2 times 0 is still 0. So there is the general form of that one. Okay, let's look at number 5. We have two ordered pairs again. They're not as nice to look at. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 will be plus plus. This is 4 over 2 fourths. So then we would multiply. That's like 4 over 1 uh, divided by 2 over 4. So we can think of that as multiplying by the reciprocal of the bottom, so this would be 4 over 2, so that is 16 over 2, or 8. And then we can use a formula for point slope, so y minus, I'm going to use this point, it, you just pick one, if, if neither one of them is the y-intercept, you just have to pick one. So y minus 5 equals 8 parentheses x minus 1 fourth, distribute the 8, 8 divided by 4 would be 2. Uh, for solving for y, we would add the 5 over. So y equals 8x plus 3 is the slope intercept. And if we wanted to put this into the general form, we would subtract over the 8x. And then we have our plus y. We'd subtract over the 3. And then remember, in general form, we like positive leading coefficients. So we change all of the signs. 0 does not have a sign, so it doesn't change. So that would be general. Okay, a vertical line is just x equals, so and it's the x-coordinate, so x equals 2. Now that would be, we don't really call that slope-intercept, because slope-intercept is y equals, so general form, if we wanted to write that a different way, we could at least do this, would be to move the 2 over. And that's it for that part. So we did the two word problems in class. Now we're going to be talking about section 1.4 over functions. 
A function is a relationship between two variables such that each value of the independent variable there corresponds exactly one value of the dependent variable. One way of thinking of that in a different terms, something a little bit more easy to say, is that each x can only be used once. Uh, for example, if I have 1, 3, I can't have another 1, any other number. So each x has to be unique, but the y's don't. So 1, 2, and 3 are all unique, but the y's don't have to be. It's this is the dependent variable, the y. It's dependent on what you plug in for x. The vertical line test states that if every vertical line that you draw crosses the graph or intersects it uh, at most once, then you're looking at a function. Because if you think about it, vertical lines are x values that are fixed. You only want each x value to be used once or intersected once. A function is one to one when each value of the dependent variable there is exactly one corresponding value for the independent. So in this case, each x is unique. That's what makes you a function. To make you a one to one function, you have to say and each y is unique. If you have both conditions, then you have a one-to-one -one function. So determine whether or not each graph is a function, first of all. So we'll do the vertical line test. If it is a function, decide if it's a one-to-one. -one. And we use the horizontal line test to determine this. So we use a vertical line test to determine if something is a function, and then a horizontal line test to see if it's one-to-one. -one. So for this first one, just imagine drawing vertical lines. Each one crosses this line only once. So that means it is a function. And this also passes the horizontal line test. Each horizontal line only crosses once. So it is one to one. This one fails the function test. If you draw a vertical line, you cross twice. And if you're not a function, there's no way you can be a one to one function. For this one, it passes the vertical line test. But it fails the horizontal line test. It crosses twice in most of the locations. So it's not one to one. For this one, you also fail the function test. So you're just not even a function. No need to do the horizontal line test if you're not even looking at a function. Okay, for domain and range, we're going to do two different things. We're going to talk about domain and range from a picture of a graph, and then we're going to find out domain from the equation. Now, the homework also asks you to find the range of the equation when it's not in a graphic form. We don't ask you that on the test. We're just going to be testing you on how to find the domain when you're looking at an equation. For a picture, you could be asked for domain and range. Um, so what I want to show you is just a tool you can use to get you the answer on those two homework questions that ask for both, and all you have is the equation. So the domain of a function is all of the independent variables. Remember, that's the x variables. Now, for every equation, that doesn't have to be x. It's just whatever's in the place of the x uh, variable. And then the range is all the y value, uh, variables or the dependent variables. So find the domain and range of each. So to find the domain, you ask yourself, out of all the x's on the number line, is each x represented by an ordered pair on this graph? Now remember, this graph goes down forever. So if you think about negative 3, you could follow it down and find a point. If I'm at 1 half, I could follow it up and find a point. So this one actually has a domain of every number on the number line. We write that as negative infinity to infinity. The range is what are the y values. The highest that this ever gets is positive 1. So any y value above positive 1 is not possible for this graph. So that means that we can get anything smaller than 1 on the y-axis. Oops, excuse me. We want to make sure parentheses. You always use parentheses with the um, infinities. So we start way down at negative infinity. There's some points way down here. 
and then our highest or maximum point is 1. And we put a bracket to mean that that point is included. You cannot put brackets on infinity. For number 2, uh, let's look at the x-axis. So I don't see any graph until we get to about 1 and a half. So on the x-axis, we would say our domain, and we could call that 3 halves so that we use a nice fraction, because 3 halves is 1.5, and it is included. And then to positive infinity, because everything after that, if you go out on x, you'll be able to go up and find a point. The range is what's the lowest or highest we can get. So if you notice, this graph is going up forever. It's growing really slow, but it's going up. So that means we'll be going all the way up to positive infinity. We'll always be able to find something. But we never can find any y values that are negative. The lowest our y value gets is 0. So that would be 0 to positive infinity. So that's how you figure out domain and range from the picture. You look at the x values that the graph represents and the y values. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about something called implied domains, because when you're looking at just the equation and they ask you to find the domain, certain ones require work and certain ones don't. Polynomial functions are understood, unless they tell you otherwise, to be all real numbers. The reason for that is you can plug anything you want into a polynomial equation, work it out, and get another real number. So it's negative infinity to infinity. Same thing for absolute values. Anything you plug into an absolute value, as long as it's a real number, you take the absolute value of it after adding or subtracting or multiplying, whatever you're doing, it's still going to be a real number. The other one that's also all real numbers are things like odd roots. So cubed root of negative 27, cubed root of positive 27, cubed root of 0. Any cubed root can be worked out and get a real number answer. Where we get into, so this is like cubed root. Where we get into trouble is even roots, like square root, fourth root, sixth root. Anytime you have a root that's even, whatever's underneath has to stay greater than or equal to 0. And then rational function, remember, have something that you're uh, going to have an x in your denominator. So you just have to make sure your denominator does not equal 0. So using those as kind of our guidelines, let's talk about what the domains of each of these would be. So this first one is the square root of 2x plus 1, which means we're dealing with an even root. So we need to set that part greater than or equal to 0 and find our domain. So that would be 2x greater than or equal to negative 1 divided by 2, x is greater than or equal to negative 1 half. In interval notation, that means negative 1 half is the smallest we get, because it says greater than or equal to, and then we go up to positive infinity. So that would be my domain. For number 4, this is a polynomial. It's just a trinomial. So this is automatically just all real numbers since they didn't say anything else. So see, some of these go really quick. Uh, 5 is a rational function, so we don't want our denominator to equal 0. So x cannot equal negative 4 if we solve that. Um, we would want to write that in interval notation, so that's negative infinity to negative 4 parentheses, because we're not including it, and then negative 4 to infinity on the other side, so the left side of negative 4 and the right side of negative 4. And to join those two statements together, we use an OR symbol, which looks like a U. This is called a union. So that is our domain there. Okay, for 6, it's absolute value, so the domain would just be all real numbers. We'll come back to 7 in just a minute. 8 is an odd root, so that's also all real numbers. The reason I skipped 7 for just a second is because this one is a square root again, but you have, when you set that greater than or equal to 0, any time the part, so if you ever have a quadratic or higher, so that's quad or higher, set greater than or equal to 0, or if you have a rational, like a fraction with x's in it on top and bottom, set greater than or equal to 0, and this could also be less than or less than or equal to, it doesn't matter which direction that is. 
if you have that scenario, you cannot just solve it for x. You can't just take square roots of both sides or anything like that. You have to factor it first. So this would be 3 plus x and 3 minus x because it's two perfect squares. You find what are called critical values. Now this would have been covered in Math 136, but we're reviewing it. So we said each of those equal to 0, so that would be negative 3 and positive 3. And then you set up a number line. And the reason for that is we don't know, based on these two different parentheses, whether or not when you multiply it makes a positive or when you multiply it makes a negative, which would not be true. We want positive values. You place those numbers on this little number line in the order from least to greatest. You determine whether they're closed circles or open circles, which is essentially a parentheses or a bracket, by looking at the equal to bar or if it doesn't have it. So we have the equal to bar, so these are going to be closed. So this is negative infinity to negative 3. This is negative 3 to 3. Notice the brackets for the closed part. And this is 3 to infinity. My number line has been split into three separate pieces. I pick a test value in each region, and then I plug it in to the 3 plus x, the 3 minus x, and I check to see when is it greater than or equal to 0. So let's pick a test value. This would be negative 4, 0 is between negative 3 and 3, and bigger than 3 would be 4. 3 plus negative 4 is negative 4. 3 minus negative 4 would be 3 plus 4, so that's positive. You don't care if the actual number is a, a 12 or a 4 or a 5, you just care about the sign. A negative times a positive is a negative, so this is a false statement because we wanted greater than or equal to 0, which means we want positive. Plug in 0, 3 plus 0 is, uh, excuse me, positive. 3 minus 0 is positive, 2 positives multiply to make a positive. That's a good region, we wanted positive. Four, uh, 3 plus 4 is positive, 3 minus 4 though is negative, so this is also negative. So there's only one region that makes things greater than or equal to 0, and so our domain here is negative 3 to 3. Now just because I didn't do all of these uh, as a range, but your WebAssign does ask for range, I'm going to show you how to find this one by using Desmos. So if you go out and you type in Desmos.com, start graphing, and you type in your equation y equals the square root of 9 minus x squared. Notice this is half of a circle. So I can see very clearly that negative 3 to 3 is the domain. That is when this circle exists on the x-axis. The range now I can pull off the picture as well. It looks like the lowest we ever get is a y value of 0, and the highest we ever get is a y value of 3. So for the ones on the homework that say find the range and all you had was an equation, you'll just go to Desmos and type that in and get your range from the picture. On the test, we only require you to know how to do domain from the equation or domain and range both from a picture. All right, so this is going to be the last one that I do on the video. The other one that's left in this section before we get to 1.5 is a little bit more complex and I don't want to do it in a video format. We'll do it together in class. So this is just evaluating a function at a specified value and we're going to simplify the results. So essentially you're just plugging in things for x and working out the order of operations. So for this first one, this says f of negative 2, whereas this is f of x. That's our function notation. So we plug in f of negative 2. This would be negative 2 squared minus 3 times negative 2 plus 2. You do not work out anything on the left. This is not f times negative 2. It's f of negative 2. It's a notation. On the right, we would do uh, exponents first. So negative 2 squared is 4. Negative 3 times negative 2 is positive 6. Bring down the plus 2. Now we're just adding. So 4 plus 6 is 10 plus 2 is 12. Now, a lot of times they don't ask you this, but that means the ordered pair we just found is I plugged in negative 2 for x and 12 for y. So this is the ordered pair that goes with what you just did. 
let's do f of 1 half. So this one might require a little bit more work. So we have 1 half squared minus 3 times 1 half plus 2. Uh, 1 half squared means you square both top and bottom, so that would be 1 over 4. This would be negative 3 over 2, and I'm going to go ahead and write this as 2 over 1. Getting a common denominator of 4, since 2 goes into 4, multiply this fraction by 2 over 2. That would be, excuse me, that's a minus. So that would be negative 6 over 4. I'm going to also get this one to be over uh, denominator 4 by multiplying top and bottom by 4, so that would be 8 over 4. 1 minus 6, so once you've got a common denominator, you just add and subtract across the top. 1 minus 6 is negative 5, plus 8 is uh, positive 3. So I'm getting 3 over 4. For this final one right here, it's asking us to plug in not just a number, we're plugging in a binomial. So this is where sometimes students will struggle is because they don't realize that when you plug in a binomial, that does change sometimes how the problem gets worked out. You may have a more complex piece of information to work out. For example, m plus 1 squared, you don't just square both parts, you have to FOIL. I can go ahead and distribute my negative 3 right here. That's going to be negative 3m minus 3 plus 2. I will FOIL the beginning. So m times m is m squared. m times 1 is m. 1 times m is m. 1 times 1 is 1. Bring down everything else. Combine like terms. m squared does not have any like terms since it is the only one with the exponent of 2. But 1m plus 1m is 2m's. Minus 3 would be negative 1m or just negative m. And then 1 minus 3 would be negative 2 plus 2 is 0. So we actually just get m squared minus m. And that is the end of the video for today.